What's up guys, this is Anime Crossover, I'm back with a new episode of What If Naruto went to the Marvel Universe Part 7 and if you did enjoy this video, give this video a like and if you're new on my channel and like my content, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more crossover fictions. Now let's begin this new video. Chapter 8. The Sea's Black Ship, October 31st, 1949, Halloween. Pacific Ocean south of Japan the amphibious class ship USS America was walking past southern Japan, entering the Pacific Ocean, when its commander and crew were issued orders for two new missions around the world. From July through August, the first patrol route was in Panama and Central America. The second mission involves another patrolling assignment in the Atlantic Ocean. The captain intended to replenish and have liberty along the eastern seaboard for the latter. Things were remained tense months after the Allies' victory over the Axis of Evil, Several ships like his were still tasked to keep an eye out for any remains of Germany's naval force that may reappear. Their orders were to apprehend German officers for war crimes committed during World War II. After a long day on the bridge, Captain Arnold Bishop was relaxing in his quarters in his comfy recliner. It was difficult to establish order on an armed ship crewed by youthful sailors of both the enlisted and officer classes. He smiled at his beautiful wife and joyful children as he stared at the picture illuminated by his desk light. He pines for them, but they understand how necessary it is for him to serve his nation, he only had to serve with honor and pride. As he approached his cup of coffee, the captain came to a halt when he spotted a slight ripple on the surface, followed by his pen rolling off the desk. As he stood up from his seat, his years of expertise with this type of foreboding force kicked in. Oh no, Bishop exclaimed as the ship was violently slammed as though by a powerful force. Picking himself up. The captain dashed out of his quarters and onto the ship's bridge, while his men dashed to their allotted posts in this type of crisis. Finally, Bishop arrived at the bridge, where his crew and XO braced themselves as a 15-foot wave rushed over the ship, crashing into the hull. Fortunately, it performed just as expected. The captain, on the other hand, had one query. Where in the hell did this storm come from? Bishop exclaimed to his longtime friend and fellow cop. After the wave poured over the ship, Carl Spencer stared at his commanding officer. We have no idea, sir. None of the weather systems picked it up until after we were hit. Helmsman. The individual said, looking at the captain, take us out of here. Ooh yeah, sir. Bishop took the PA phone and spoke clearly. Everybody brace yourselves and stay in your positions. After hanging up the phone, Bishop couldn't escape the feeling of foreboding and walked to the navigational map, specifically for the nautical coordinates. When the coordinates appeared on the screen, the feeling worsened as a bead of sweat slipped down his cheek. As he waited for an answer, Bishop grabbed the international radio and dialed the Japanese naval base. Come on, come on, come on, come on. USS America, this is Naval Base Osaka, and we have received your emergency signal. Send reinforcements to our location right now, where? Sir, what is it? Bishop inquired after being interrupted. We have an incoming. Both of the ship's highest-ranking officials watched at the main display panel as a single dot approached the ship from the starboard side at inconceivable speed. What is fast enough to come out of nowhere and approach our ship? Is there an island nearby? Bishop inquired, despite having an idea. His navigator plotted their present location and utilized the GPS monitor to locate any nearby islands. He got a, yes, from the young sailor. Set sail for it. Sir? We have no choice. Bishop stated firmly as the helmsman obliged and guided the ship to their new destination. Naval Base Osaka, our coordinates are in the Forbidden Zone Beta 300, Carl said, stiffening. Send reinforcements, please. We hear you, America, and help is on the way. Bishop picked up the phone and stood in balance despite the ship being battered by another wave. His head dropped down because he knew no reinforcements were on their way. His sole sorrow was that he could no longer see his family's faces. He prayed for assistance. TTII PMX TTII PMX TTII PM, actual time, November 1, 2005. Boston is a city in Massachusetts. The fam got one of the nicest nights sleep in a long time after a modest party to honor the twins' first walk. Unfortunately, the following day was a Monday, which meant an early morning stroll around the city. The cloaked Patronus jumped to another building, suppressing a yawn as he did so, and stopped at the edge when he arrived. His mind was replaying his clone's memories from the night before. The unknown yet strongly dark energy deep in the mountain outside of the city, those spiders and teenaged prisoners, and, finally, 
that youngster he encountered at the food truck fighting the enormous spider. Naruto suspects Rokuro performed something similar regarding the light style of Yang and the dark style of Yin, two extremely advanced nature transformations of Chakra based on what the clone sensed. Naruto and Kurama were both curious as to how he achieved it. They both agreed, however, that no one in this dimension possesses Chakra, but rather Ki, the same form of living energy that the elder and members of Ryozanpaka, as well as the rest of the humans in the previous reality, possessed. Well, based on what we know so far, it's possible that there are people who use their ki in the same way that we ninja and tailed beast use chakra, albeit in different ways. Like the yin and yang transformation you claim that boy used. What do you mean by claim? Don't tell me you're skeptical about it. Naruto clenched his teeth in response to Kurama's snort. Don't be like that, Kurama, Ashura begged the tailed beast. Naruto's just a little antsy from waking up this morning. What do you mean? Naruto exclaimed, stunned by his ancestor's apparent betrayal. As a result, there was a display of squabbling between the Jinshuriki, tailed beast, and the ghost, which fortunately did not wake anyone awake. It didn't last long, though, as Naruto spun around and deflected something with his drawn pivot blade before being thrown back by the unexpected force behind the assault. Naruto held his left hand after landing to try to calm the shaking. That really hurt, Datbeo, exclaimed the hooded Jinchuriki, shortly following his verbal tick. Not ever again. The perpetrator of the attack was clothed in an unusual outfit. He was dressed in a light green kimono under a long green cape with an ornate blue collar clasped around his shoulders. His eyes were extraordinarily yellow, and his brown-red hair reached his neck in a manner reminiscent of a woman's natural straight hair. Face God's judgment, the attacker declared before launching another katana attack and disappearing like the ninja's shunshin. Naruto followed and vanished, and both warriors reappeared on opposite sides of where they had previously stood. You're fast, he observed, slightly intrigued. Not bad at all, Patronus said as he adjusted his grasp on the pivot blade. How are you? His assailant did not respond. All right, let me go first, and you tell me my name is Patronus. Protector. How unsightly boastful of you, he thought despite the fact that he couldn't see the hero's face. Instead of inquiring, the man stated calmly, I touched a nerve. A friend of mine gave me the name. I appreciate it if you don't insult him, Patronus cautioned, fist clenched. I apologize for speaking ill of the dead, just as I will be sorry once I take your life. Naruto moaned loudly, slumping forward with his head. Why? Just surrender to fate. It'll be easier for you and me, the assailant said, raising his katana and pointing its blade at Patronus. I shall grant your request. My name is Shogo Amakusa, and you shall pay with your life with my style of the heavens. Perfect. Patronus muttered as he shunshined to match Shogo's extraordinary speed and collided with their blades. The early birds below yawned, jogged, or drove across the metropolis as they detected sparks despite the dawn light, though they quickly dismissed it as their imagination. The many conflicts soon led to the outskirts of the city, where Naruto and Shogo reappeared after one final clash in a familiar location. The location where Rokuro rescued the teenagers. A light breeze rustled their capes as they reenacted their previous encounters. This guy's fast. Unbelievably fast. I think he sped up after one of our fights, Patronus said, looking at a minor gash on his haori near his leg. He deflected the strike and the blade did not make contact with his skin, but this is going to take a while. Meanwhile, Shogo finished his observations while keeping an eye on his opponent. Very few people can match my speed, let alone block my attacks. No one outside of my school can evade like he did. Even when I used full speed in that last clash, he still countered it. His grip on the katana's hilt tightened slightly. This will not go unpunished, he thought calmly before assuming a posture and sheathing his blade while keeping his hand on the handle. Patronus ran through many scenarios of the situation that seemed to have befallen him. None of them involved fleeing due to the danger of Shogo causing harm to bystanders in order to bring him out into the open. With no other choice but to battle, Naruto grinned beneath his hood at the prospect of a good fight. This is going to be fun, Patronus mumbled as he sprang into the air. He was preparing to launch one of his clone aerial assaults when he became aware of a familiar presence. Above him. What? Shogo swung his katana in a double-handed grip at the shocked hero. A slight twinkle in his eyes as his body succumbed to gravity. Ryatsusen. The sword's blade made contact with Patronus' body, but not in the way that was planned. 
The combined force of the sword blow and Naruto's hidden blade bracer caused the ground below to erupt in a massive cloud of debris and boulders. Patronus' eyes widened as Shogo spun his blade's tip towards his throat, still grimacing from the impact. Ryatsusen. Zan. Naruto shunshined to avoid the stabbing action, reappearing on the side of a tree, slightly squatting before propelling himself forward with his pivot blade poised to stab. After a rapid sheath and redraw motion, his sword was blocked by Shogo's katana, resulting in a clash as sparks flew from the metal weapon's contact. My turn. Patronus pulled his right hidden blade and skillfully stabbed Shogo's vulnerable left side. Until, much to his surprise and, evidently, Shogo's, it was prevented by the wooden sheath itself. To think you blocked my Soriusen with such a small blade in execution. Patronus averted his gaze slightly, embarrassed by his unintentional obstruction. Sure. That's what I do, he answered nervously before turning serious as the blonde booted Shogo with a loud bang towards a tree. But you're dead serious about it, killing me. Shogo rose up from the fallen tree behind him and strode towards his opponent with his katana at the ready once more, brushing off the attack as if it were nothing. Patronus mentally prepared one of his martial arts skills as well as his hidden blades for the upcoming attack. I gave you my answer earlier, I had hoped to alleviate your suffering by now, but you are skilled, Shogo said, etching his left foot forward as his right foot sunk slightly into the earth. This is the end of you. Patronus's eyes narrowed beneath his cowl and he responded with two words, bring it. Kuzuryasen, Shogo had started his attack just as Patronus had finished his final phrase. Clap boom Naruto's eyes widened in amazement as he couldn't respond to the onslaught or the nine wounds on his arms, shoulders, and legs, not to mention the killer knife wound in his chest. Shogo sighed heavily as he turned around to see his opponent on the floor, the clink of his blade and sheath merging. You outlasted most of my enemies, you should be proud of that, he said, looking up at the sky with a sad expression. With the Sun Queen's help and power, I will rid the world of corruption and fanaticism, just as these superheroes and villains in this country have done. A loud crack halted him as he searched for the cause, till his gaze fell to the ground and he was smacked with an uppercut. The swordsman flew for a few seconds before crashing on top of a tree, smashing it with his weight. What was that? A partner. Shogo struggled to get to his feet due to the intensity of the uppercut. He rubbed his chin to relieve the discomfort as he looked up and saw what he couldn't believe he was witnessing. That's impossible. Phew. That was close, a perfectly fine and unhurt Patronus massaged his head sheepishly. After his unfortunate fall to the ground only moments before Shogo's Ryatsusen, Zan could stab him, a clone was produced, and the original hid underground awaiting the perfect chance to strike. If Naruto was honest after obtaining the memories, he found it unsettling to look at the area where his clone once lay after being murdered by Shogo's strike. That attack he used, it was much faster than before, with nine simultaneous strikes all aimed at the nine spots on the body, it was unavoidable. Patronus returned his gaze to Shogo, who was still perplexed by what he was seeing. Magic? Are you a wizard? The swordsman said, surprised, as Patronus' sweat dropped and looked dry. Sure, sure. I'm a wizard, Patronus cynically replied, moving his hands in an exaggerated mystical manner reminiscent of Mickey Mouse from Fantasia, Sesame Street. For the first time, a rare expression of rage flashed across his face. You mock me? Shogo stated calmly, albeit angrily. I've been mocking you the whole time, you just didn't realize it until now, Patronus revealed as he adjusted his haori before drawing Tenkaichi, preferring to settle this with the sword for the time being. I guess I should give you a swordsman bout this time. Shogo was irritated by the idea that the hooded figure had not been taking him seriously the entire time. You dare to insult me? I will have your head and take it to this Sun Queen, I assume. His Jinchuriki and Ghost roommate both nodded in agreement to the fox's assertion. Can we torture him a little more for more information? Kurama asked, gleefully. No, no. Both Naruto and Ashura said bluntly as the fox sniffed angrily. So, I assume you're going to use, that. Yep, Patronus replied simply as he assumed a Shogo unusual stance. The hooded ninja held the blade in his right hand, tilted forward, with his left arm parallel in the off hand in a challenge motion, his right leg back and his left leg extended forwards in a brace-ready stance. That is an unusual style. What is its name? Shogo inquired, his curiosity piqued. You tell me about yours, and I'll tell you about mine. Shogo closed his eyes to think, but soon found himself in the same frame of mind as his opponent. 
the two practitioners of different techniques ran with amazing speed and collided with their blades, causing a large dust cloud to explode from the blowback of the hits. TTII PMX TTII PMX TTII PM the helicarrier of S.H.I.E.L.D. New York's Manhattan Island, come on. Steve looked around at his fighting partners, who were closely surrounding him to avoid any openings he could exploit. His ears pricked slightly as he whirled around to grab an overhand punch, threw the attacker over the shoulder, and kicked him towards one of the attackers as they all went to the ground in a heap. While the legend was still flipping one of their own, the remainder of the shield agents surged at him, attacking in all directions in an attempt to overcome him. However, it was the legend who was crucial in the Second World War. When one of them realized he was in the air, he felt a familiar yet painful agony in his stomach and quickly landed on the ground. His gaze averted upwards, seeing Captain America in a low crouch, arms close to his sides. Jujutsu? No, it was a combination of something. No wonder he's known as the legend in our military, the spy reflected before passing out. Steve exhaled as he stood up fully, grabbing a towel to wipe away the sweat as the resident medics rushed in to transport the unconscious agents to the infirmary. The legend made his way through the corridors to the bridge, where Fury wanted to meet with him about an important task. There was one presence that dwarfed the chattering of many agents sitting in front of monitors tuned on different frequencies around the planet. Nick Fury stood on a small podium, quickly changing his gaze to each screen that displayed different topics, such as the SHIELD directory, military bulletins, or news outlets reporting recent heroic exploits. When a familiar presence alerted him to the one he had been waiting for, his head pricked up. Captain. Director, Steve said curtly as the director of SHIELD turned around, holding a file. We have a situation involving national security, Fury explained before handing the hero the hand, his gaze fixed on the massive glass windows. Steve sighed deeply before his eyes narrowed as he read the Navy report, is there a missing civilian naval vessel outside the Dragon's Triangle? That's the official report, Fury said, facing Rogers for the first time since he arrived. Inofficially, the ship was inside the Dragon's Triangle when they sent the distress signal, and as you're probably aware, the Dragon's Triangle is Forbidden Zone Beta 300. SH established many Forbidden Zones around the world. D because of their volatility and unknown circumstances, such as the Negative Zone, Bermuda Triangle, and Dragon's Triangle. All government vessels from any country that are caught in one of the Forbidden Zones are proclaimed DOS, dead on the spot. That ruling had never sat well with the captain since he awoke from his 70-year slumber. He believed that no soldier from any military branch should be left behind, and that any attempts to rescue them were much worse and a dishonor to all previous soldiers and veterans. There's something else, Rogers. We monitor all naval traffic in that area to ensure that no ship enters. Fury hesitated, and Steve realized what that meant. Civilians didn't listen. We sent warning signals to its captain before they entered the triangle, but he ignored them and continued onward, and the signal went silent moments later, ten minutes before they vanished, just like the USS America did back in 1949. Steve turned around, effectively silenced the director. I'm going there, he said, pausing when two agents blocked his path. Do you want to stand aside or risk broken bones? The agents gulped audibly but remained on their feet. Men. Let him go. Captain America spared the eye patch wearing man a glance and continued his pace towards one of the hangar bays with steely eyes of purpose to save the citizens, and he wasn't going by himself. TTII PMX TTII PMX TTII PM Boston is a city in Massachusetts. A certain exorcist was nearby, holding a breakfast burrito in one hand and a drink in the other. His three shikigami sat next to him, each holding a bit of Rokuro's burrito and watching the show with their creator, Master. I wonder if I could get his autograph? Rokuro wondered casually before shrugging his shoulders and returning his attention to his dinner and the live combat in the distance. His morning was routine. He awoke, showered, dressed, and prepared to begin his day as a tourist. Only after he had purchased his breakfast did his senses pick up on the city's strong spiritual vibe. Rokuro had trailed it to the city's outskirts, where he discovered Boston's hero fighting a revenant. Revenants are beings who were formerly people but died with regret, rage, or any other undesirable feelings. They are not the same as the exorcist's mortal adversaries. Impurities. The name alone instilled fear in any exorcists who were not among the Union's twelve heavenly commanders. The 1,000-year battle caused much misery and suffering, but his people remained hopeful that it would end soon. 
even he is aware of it and longs for the day when it will happen. Ryushosen. Naruto used the blade of his sword to deflect a rising assault from underneath, generating another shockwave from the fighter's might. According to what he saw, the last attack was intended to sever his chin. This sword style is very dangerous. I will second that. As Naruto reacted with a low kick, Ashura agreed with the tailed beast, Mi-3. Shogo noticed it coming and quickly lifted his target leg into the air before lowering it to strike his skull. Patronus, though, lunged out with a fast palm thrust, striking him with a tremendous shockwave. Furinji Oshi eat! exclaimed Furinji. Shogo buried his katana into the ground to reduce the impact of the blast, as well as his feet, before lunging forward with a blade thrust. Patronus drew his blade close to his body to counter the assault, leaving Shogo vulnerable to an elbow thrust. What? Shogo exclaimed, surprised at the discomfort. The swordsmen exchanged blows with their blades, causing sparks to fly, trees to fall, and the ground to disintegrate from the force of the attacks. Imagine you are yourself. What? Patronus turned to face Shogo as their blades clashed, cracking beneath their combined ability to overpower one another. Was I thinking out loud? My bad. He broke the impasse by jumping back just as Shogo charged at him. However, the old master deserves credit. Another flashback begins, six paths of old man. Whack, ow! exclaimed Naruto as he nursed the bump on his head. He stared at his master, who, like him, had a bakken in his right hand. It appears we still need to work on your manners. Back to the grill later, the sage of six paths commented casually, slightly smirking at his disciple's lemon-puckered countenance. Now, back to the training. Master. What is the point of this style? All of its movements and techniques are defensive in nature, Naruto said as he took the initial stance of the described sword style. I mean, from all of the others you showed me, this one doesn't seem right for me. Because you're an all-out offensive ninja? Naruto flashed a dazzling smile. Yep. And that's exactly why I'm teaching you this style, Hagoromo explained after hearing a, uh, from the blonde Uzumaki. Being an all-around offensive guy is fine, but it will backfire on you when someone comes along and fights you with a different fighting style. What are the odds of that happening? I'm not sure, Naruto admits with a face fault. Now imagine yourself in the middle of a storm. Your blade must never breach the circle. Maintain constant movement of the blade to leave as little room as possible for absolute defense, Hagoromo said as he demonstrated the sword-style motion to his trainee. Attack on me. Naruto smirked and pounced at him with a sword strike to the stomach before whirling around to the opposite direction. A ruse. Gotcha, exclaimed the blonde as his wind chakra coated blade was ready to strike the sage's bakken downward. Before they launched into another round of offensive and defense, the first ninja chuckled at his descendant's look. It continued until the much younger ninja was knocked out by a single strike to the head of the sage's hilt, and he awoke with a pounding headache. You see what I mean? Naruto, pouting, turned his head to hide his embarrassment. Yeah, he said, returning his gaze to his master. That style is insane. No matter what I tried, I couldn't get past your defenses. In the hands of a proficient user, that person is formidable on the battlefield. In the hands of a master, he or she is virtually unstoppable. Hagoromo grinned in response, and Naruto looked like a little kid being given candy for the first time. I'm assuming your perspective has shifted now. Naruto abruptly stood up and saluted like a soldier. Yes, sir. Flashback concludes. Doriasen. When Shogo sank his sword into the ground and swung it out with such force that several car-sized boulders hurled at him with dazzling speed, Patronus shuddered. Patronus created momentum by swinging Tenkaichi's blade around him before slashing conventionally, with one technique in mind. The slash's extra momentum and strength sliced through most of the debris with ease, while others were deflected back towards Shogo, who jumped high in the air. He turned around to see the rocks digging into the trees behind him. He deflected them. I thought he was just cutting through them like any other amateur swordsman. Meanwhile, Patronus glanced at his blade and the outcome of the technique's execution. He squealed with delight, his face engraved with a bright smile. Yeah. I did it. I finally did it. He exclaimed to the heavens, much to the consternation of his opponent and their distant audience. The old man had better pay up once I showed him. What are you talking about? Shogo said as he landed and sheathed his blade in preparation for another batojutsu. Patronus responded by sticking his tongue out, even if the opposing swordsman couldn't see it. Nothing you need to know, the blonde ninja said before responding with a shunshin to Shogo's massive charge. 
After another volley of assaults, both offensive and defensive, the two warriors moved their unseen combat to the top of a cliff overlooking the city. Shogo was puzzled at his opponent, who was absolutely calm as he evaluated the sword style utilized against his Mitsurugi style, it lacked attacking powers, but its defensive qualities exceeded his expectations. This is unacceptable. My way of the sword is superior to all. Amakasa, enraged, tightened his grasp on the hilt, preparing for one of his two fiercest attacks. This time I will kill him. This guy is giving off a crazy amount of energy now. I'm going to have to be careful from now on, Naruto said as he came face to face with Shogo's glare. He's gotten even faster? The ninja and the swordsman exchanged blows, sending the former flying through the air and crashing through many trees. He barely raised his blade to deflect another hit aimed at his head. Patronus and Shogo exchanged glances before the latter inhaled deeply with puffed cheeks. Patronus expelled a powerful torrent of wind at Shogo, thinking, wind style, stream. What on earth? Patronus shunshined over Shogo, smirking at his flying opponent, and swung at him, which was blocked, sending him back into the earth with a loud, crash, Suiraku Konoha, Patronus flung Tenkaichi above his head again, this time with a double-handed hold. Shogo rolled out of the way and charged at Patronus with his sword sheathed, Soryasen. That technique. Patronus exclaimed in astonishment as he successfully deflected both strikes. He was caught off guard, however, when Shogo kicked him in the stomach, but the ninja quickly recovered his balance. He afterward said, oh crap. The reason for this was a nine-strike attack from all sides at the same time. Kuzuryasen. The considerably more powerful technique kicked up a massive dust cloud over the wooded region. Meanwhile, Rokuro and his Shikigami clung to the ground for dear life as it shook fiercely. What the hell? exclaimed the exorcist, his eyes welling up with tears. Rokuro and the three Shikigami watched the cloud being blown away by the wind as two silhouettes became more visible by the second as they moved to a safer area with a better view. Both warriors were still standing as the last blanket vanished but one of them was not on the ground and had not lost any blood. Shogo's eyes were wide as his sword had struck nothing but air, while Patronus maintained Tenkaichi's point at the former's throat, his body in a dodging motion. Patronus inwardly complimented his master's sword-style instruction as he narrowly parried eight of the nine strikes from their nine different trajectories. Another technique employed by the aforementioned sword-style was the use of delicate transitional positions to avoid any long-range assaults with lightning speed. The previously indicated transitional postures enabled Naruto to narrowly dodge the thrust targeted at his heart and close in for the winning attack. Lay down your weapon right now. Patronus screamed as Shogo was immediately wrapped in a dark glow. And no. My lady, I can still. Ah. Patronus sighed as the only thing left of Shogo was his clothes and a smoldering skeleton in front of him. What the hell? The cloaked ninja asked, rubbing his brow and shrugging his shoulders. Oh well. Time for me to go home, he said, sheathing Tenkaichi in its scabbard and riding away in a shunshin. Just before Rokuro rudely crashed on his backside. Damn it! I missed him again! When he heard chuckling from above, a tick mark emerged on his skull. Quiet you three, he said angrily at the Shikigami. Man, I have. Explain what you're doing in my city. Rokuro nodded absent-mindedly to the voice behind him. Yeah, and how I'm going to be the best exorcist in, he finally paused turning around to see Boston's hero staring down at him. That was due to their height disparity, P. Patronus. Hello there, Patronus said, looking towards the area where the sirens could be heard. Let's go somewhere private for us, okay. With no time to argue, the hooded ninja grabbed the exorcist and the three small creatures before shunshining to a remote location. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM, now then. What do you want? Naruto smiled, though it couldn't be seen. Uh. Um. Rokuro was speechless for the first time in his life. Patronus snapped his fingers as he waved his hand in front of the exorcist's face. You who, he said again, snapping his fingers. Oi, are you there? A notepad and a pen held by a grinning Rokuro crashed against the hooded hero's face faster than he could react. Can I please have your autograph? Huh? Patronus said as he sat up, blinking as he digested what was going on around him. That's a first. What is it? Rokuro questioned, tilting his head with his shikigami. Patronus turned his head to hide his embarrassment and cried internally, my very first fan. Two chibi copies of Kurama and Ashura appeared on his shoulders, holding up their arms in the air, 
with a banner reading, first fan ever, above them. Hooray! Hooray! They yelled, bouncing up and down. Uh, Patronus? Are you okay? Rokuro inquired, his brow furrowed. Never better. Patronus said, shocking his apparent fan with his outburst. You made my day, especially after what I went through a few minutes ago. What did you think? It was now Rokuro's time to tilt his head. What exactly do you mean? I'm talking about the fight, after all, you were watching. Naruto smirked as Rokuro and the Shikigami were startled. He sensed them ahead of time? This guy was more talented than he realized. You're not normal, are you? Rokuro remarked dryly. His Shikigami nodded as though that were the obvious answer. Patronus was the next to tilt his head. But aren't we all normal in our own way? He asked, his index finger resting on his lower lip. Is he a grown-up or a child? Anyway. Patronus stepped into Rokuro's personal space before lashing out and grabbing the three Shikigami from his shoulders. Now, what are you three? A summoning creature. The creature's gnawing on his fingers forced him to release them as an answer. Ouch! You little runts! exclaimed the hooded ninja as the Shikigami returned to their master. You'll come to regret that. When Rokuro heard that, he took a step forward. Not while I'm here, I'll make you reconsider hurting my family. Patronus' mood brightened as he patted Rokuro's head, impressed by the younger boy's bravery in standing up to him to protect them. Nice. You stood your ground to protect those you care about, and that makes you okay in my book. Huh. Was all Rokuro could say as Patronus turned around, suggesting he was about to depart. Hold on a minute. Patronus looked at him, sighing loudly. What happens now? Are you an exorcist? A what? T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M. Logan International Airport is located in Boston, Massachusetts. A man of Japanese origin ran towards one of the rental car counters as customs and ATF personnel swept around the perimeter. Unfortunately, the person in front of him had taken the last car of the day. If you want, Mr. Nishimura, there are taxis outside, the lady added, trying to console him. Thank you for your assistance, the man said as he sat in one of the many uncomfortable rows. Jet lag had always been a killer for him, particularly at his age. Nakamura reached into his pocket and took out a folded picture, which he quickly unfurled. Sam, he said with affection. Two young girls in black graduation gowns stood in front of London's Big Ben Tower, carrying their certificates proudly and delighted at their success. His daughter inherited his features, but her mother's hair color and adventurous personality, he found out a few days ago that the ship his daughter had boarded had vanished without a trace. It was last found south of the Sea of Japan. Unlike before, he was stressed out throughout the last two days. He rushed to the Defense Force headquarters in Japan to save his daughter and the crew of the Endurance, but his pleas were rejected. He called a friend who worked for S.H.I.E.L.D. and hoped that his buddy might convince the director to send assistance, but the mention of the Dragon's Triangle in the island of Yamatai terminated the phone line before he could even ask. The businessman tried everything, but neither his friends nor associates in key law enforcement agencies would accept or listen to his requests. He was losing hope because the Avengers were no longer active, and if they were, the heroes would have rescued them by now. That despondency was alleviated when word of a new American hero emerged in Boston. The mayor and his family were kidnapped by a villain, and the hero saved them. Patronus was the name of the hero, a strange yet fitting name. Since then, he had been following every piece of Patronus-related news since July, knowing that he was the one to contact if anything happened to his daughter. That time had finally arrived. Nishimura took out his phone and dialed the numbers, please respond. Click, good day, this is Police Chief Watson's office. This is Mr. Nishimura, and I need to speak with the police chief right away. The man stood up and headed to the nearest bus terminal exit. T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M Boston's Fenway Park, yada. No. Rokuro performed his own happy dance while Patronus, who had lost a wager, paid him $5. Boston was picked to win 3-2, and New York was picked to win 3-2 plus an extra home run or two. Damn it, Patronus grumbled, his arms folded. With a brutally arrogant smirk, Rokuro poked his finger at him. Ha ha, you lose. The Yankees are better. Hey, WHO said that? Let's kill him, says one. After the enraged fan sought for them, the pair hid beneath the lights. The ninja and exorcist abandoned their position once the coast was clear before confronting each other. Are you an exorcist from Kyoto, Japan? 
sent here on Halloween to stop any demons or yokai that slipped through the barrier? As Patronus continued, Rokuro and the Shikigami nodded simultaneously. And this said barrier weakens on Halloween, and all exorcists from Japan stop creatures on that same day throughout the globe. They nodded once more. I see, and you mentioned wanting to see me, why? Because you're awesome, Rokuro simply stated, and Naruto resisted the temptation to hug him. And you come from a village of mercenaries that used to protect the innocent until a rogue member massacred almost everyone except you and your parents. Patronus felt a little bad as Rokuro continued to prattle over the falsehood he fed him. Despite his typical trustworthiness, Naruto had to put his family first. Of course, the falsehood was founded on reality. The reality of coming from a hamlet of trained people to protect their residence, home, and country. The hooded ninja regained his composure and extended his hand. It was nice meeting you, but you never told me your name. Or are you? Yellow dragon? The exorcist asked, taking his hand and laying a photo on his chest. Oh well, it's for his security as well. The photo showed the two of them shoulder hugging. Right, right. The autograph. He signed it, Benio and Rokuro for life, because Benio was evidently a fan of his as well. Yada. Rokuro exclaimed as his shikigami danced in a circle, holding stubby hands together. The exorcist activated a talisman and opened a small doorway behind him after calming down from his adolescent outburst. I hope we meet again, Patronus, and come visit Japan when you have the chance, he added as he entered the void with his shikigami. Patronus giggled as he looked up at the sky with a smile. Something tells me we're going to see each other a lot more from now on, he said as he hit the button on his earpiece. Sky? What's up? You've been summoned, Patronus. Huh? Patronus exclaimed in disbelief. By who? TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Downtown 23rd Precinct, you have to understand how insane this is, Ethan. The tired guy sighed hard since the favor he requested was clearly too big an order. Also, the chief had conflicted feelings about the vigilante whose bravery inspired police officers under his supervision, yet the oath he had taken since his academy graduation and years on the job told him to arrest the hooded figure. But it was the daughter of a friend, and Sam was his goddaughter. When Sam was mentioned, the regulations were thrown out the window. It was also his law that seemed to apply to everyone on Earth or throughout the enormous cosmos. After all, family comes first. You are not required to be present, Daniel. This will be between me and him. Daniel rested his hand on the shoulder of an old buddy. You know I'd move heaven and earth to find Sam and bring her home, Ethan said, looking at him. What? You do know that there are people in this world who can literally do that. To cover his embarrassment, the senior police chief coughed. Anyway, he returned his gaze to Ethan after removing the reddened cheeks. Patronus sure is taking his time getting here. Not really. Both the businessman and the police chief were startled when they turned around to see Patronus standing behind them, his arms crossed in a joking fashion. I've only been here for 10 minutes, which is a good thing because I heard some juicy stuff about the police chief here. The said professional gaped as he realized the hero knows what he and his wife do in the bedroom. However, is your wife still willing to do that? Patronus pondered. From what I've heard, it's nearly impossible, unless. Enough. Bam Patronus peered at the door while Nishimura restrained a giggle before turning to face the former. He was taller than the businessman expected, and the orange-black color scheme threw him off, but it was unique. The dato on his back demonstrated his competence with it but his entire body language indicated that the hero prefers a hands-on approach with criminals. Anyway, who are you and what are you after? Well, isn't he rude? Nishimura sarcastically said before clearing his throat. I'm going to need your help, Patronus. With what, exactly? When Patronus was going to speak, his father raised his hand and said, my daughter has gone missing, under abnormal circumstances. Patronus proceeded to the edge and sat down before pointing to the place next to him and giving the man a seat. Tell me everything, and I'll give you my answer. Nishimura was about to protest, but then he remembered Sam and how her and Lara's safety were more essential than an argument. From then on, he revealed to Boston's hero everything he knew about the dragon's triangle and the secrets it held. The following day, Uzumaki Manor in the homestead grounds. The Uzumaki leader was preparing to travel to Japan by preparing his weapons of choice to bring to his hired assignment. Naruto headed down to the basement, where his wives and children were waiting for him. He sighed and kissed each of them passionately for 20 seconds, while the twins got raspberries on their heads. 
He told his wives everything that had happened earlier in the day following his patrol. The strong swordsman with a peculiar style, the exorcist Rokuro, and finally the assignment he was hired for by his concerned father, Nishimura. His daughter Sam, it appears, embarked on an exploration trip someplace in Dragon's Triangle, the Pacific Ocean's own Bermuda Triangle. One of the criteria he made for her to depart was that she call him every two hours, but there was no call. Naruto was ready to decline the offer and explain that it could be due to poor mobile reception, but the expression in his eyes told him otherwise. The gaze of a worried father. As a father, Naruto would go to any length to find and save the twins if they were in danger. A scenario he hopes never occurs in his life. As a result, he accepted the position. The girls, on the other hand, were displeased. This meant they'd be without him for several days. Naruto had anticipated this and made certain they were not dissatisfied the night before, which explained their perpetual shine. I love you girls. We love you, too, the girls said as Naruto kissed his children again. Naruto put on his hood, looked at the clock, and set the two hands to a specific time. As four spots of light appeared at each of the four corners, the bricks within the wall shifted and produced a door-like aperture in front of him. The lights then surged forward to the center of the cavern-like entryway, blanketing it within the frames. Colors twisted and warped within the door until a familiar sight, particularly the twins, drew their attention. When Ashla and Masaki spotted Tokyo Tower, they stretched out their arms and cooed. When they watched their father pass through it, their cooing stopped, and the wall returned to its natural state. How about some lunch, everybody? Kuroka and the twins exclaimed, while Seiko and Medusa shrugged. Their thoughts as a family shared only one thing, their favorite blonde in the multiverse. Naruto, come home safely. Nishimura Private Ward of Tokyo International Airport. After some touring in the famed city, Naruto, dressed in his Patronus suit, approached the hangar just as Nishimura emerged from the doors, shocked to see him. Does this mean? I was never going to say, no, Mr. Nishimura, Patronus said, shaking the businessman's hand gratefully. I'm going to assume everything is in order. Well, apparently so. Patronus' hands clenched into fists when he recognized the voice behind him and didn't need to look back. Captain America was dressed in his trademark uniform, his famed shield affixed to his right arm. As the other hero turned around to face him, said soldier approached him. Patronus. Captain. The unexpectedly tense atmosphere between the two protagonists made Nishimura gag. The businessman summoned his guts and stood between them, as best he could. I believe you two are acquainted. Somewhat, Patronus stated flatly, much to Captain America's consternation. In case the two of you were wondering, I've been keeping an eye on everything concerning the Dragon's Triangle, Steve groaned as he noticed the hooded hero's fist creaking slightly. When the living legend's gaze pierced him, Patronus tilted his head. What? You're going to stop us from going there? What the captain said next threw the ninja and his unofficial client so hard that they nearly fell to the ground. Not at all, in fact, I'm going there myself and was planning on asking for your assistance, Patronus. A. T T I I P M X T T I I P M X T T I I P M, after three hours. The Sea of Japan as the aircraft waded through the lightning struck gloomy thunderclouds, two heroes aboard the legendary Quinjet of S.H.I.E.L.D. worked together to save the crew of the Endurance. One of them, fortunately, was an experienced pilot. Captain America pushed down the wheel feeling his stomach empty as the Quinjet performed a fast nosedive to avoid a lightning strike, much to Patronus' anger. Following that, the airplane managed to discover a little clearing resembling the eye of a hurricane. So, I take it we're in the middle of the mysterious storm, Patronus said as Captain America pressed several buttons, causing a counter to appear. Follow me, Captain America motioned to the ninja as they headed to the end of the plane. He took out a parachute and handed it to Patronus, you'll need this. Patronus questioned, what's that? As he peered at the object in front of him. Steve, face faulting to the ground, glanced up in surprise at the hooded figure. Are you serious? Said the novice hero, who responded with a confused nod. I don't think I believe this. Welcome to the club, pal, Patronus grumbled as Captain America pressed the button beside him, opening the hangar doors as a strong wind blew into the plane, bristling against the hero's clothes. How about a tornado? We're actually outside of the island's storm radius, so the weather is easy. Patronus gave him a look before turning to face the raging storm, he calls this easy? Here's the game plan, Patronus. We'll free fall to the sea and swim our way to the island. 
Yamatai is about 10 miles away, according to the GPS onboard, Captain America teased. Think you can keep up with me? Patronus chuckled as he moved closer to the edge of the hangar and looked at the old soldier. I should have asked you that, he quipped as he nosedived into the wet ocean, just like Captain America, without a parachute. The protectors mentally readied themselves for whatever hurdles the island's shroud of mystery held. Nothing will stand in their way of rescuing the stranded folks and reuniting them with their family. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Island of Yamatai, all right, Patronus. Let's go, Captain America said after finding a nearby cave and lighting a fire to dry their garments. When the novice hero did not respond, the veteran went in search of him, only to discover Patronus already asleep against the walls. Really? He was gripped by fascination as the sleeping hero was suddenly weak and vulnerable. The opportunity to discover his true identity. He shook his head and chose to sit instead, knowing that trust was essential between them, especially after what occurred in Boston. Thanks. The living legend turned around to see Patronus sitting upright, presumably awake and stretched out as he stood up and walked for the exit. Where are you going? Patronus replied before leaving the cave, to scout ahead, find rendezvous points and routes for the island. Captain America lifted his left arm after placing his shield next to him as he rolled the sleeve to the upper forearm and exposed a black screen on a protective sleeve, feeling it was better to give him space. He slid his finger across it, and the featureless black screen was replaced by the shield logo on a blue background. This is Captain America calling Shield Base Osaka and nearby agencies, and I repeat, this is Captain America, the experienced hero worried. This is SHIELD's latest communication technology, and I can't get through, which is obviously not good. He touched numerous buttons on the screen and talked into it. This is Captain America, he said, looking at the device's upper right corner. 0400 on the island of Yamatai, one of the forbidden zones registered to shield files, I am stationed in what appeared to be the southwest sector of the island, accompanied by Boston's own hero who goes by the name Patronus. As he peered out towards the cave, he was silenced by the thunder and lightning. Patronus had taken the initiative to scout the area around our base camp. Hopefully, once the storm has passed, we can begin our search for survivors. He seems bright and didn't hesitate to join me to save the civilians. I hope he'll begin to trust me, but only time will tell. Another wave of lightning strikes and thunder struck him again. However, there is something about this island that bothers me. I've had this uneasy feeling since I stepped foot on the land, and I have a feeling Patronus and I are about to have our work cut out for us. Another sound pulled his attention to the cave's exterior, but it wasn't the lightning or thunder. Wasn't that a gunshot? TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM, that was a gunshot, wasn't it? Patronus asserted rather than asked as he tree hopped multiple trees and vaulted over destroyed aircraft and houses on his route to the source of the gunfire. You might want to reconsider as multiple gunshots, Ashura advised his descendant, reincarnation. Yeah. Naruto was astounded by the sight below him after ascending a mountain and activating his kitsune sense. The range had improved, but the quality required more work. He heard three more gunshots as fires raged through modest Japanese-style dwellings, while an army of armed men chuckled at the spectacle in front of them. Naruto leapt himself over another tree while hiding in the leaves, allowing his ninja training to do the work for him. Find the girl. Girl? She shot Vladimir. She's dead said the other armed man as flashlights loomed over one of the bodies in front of them. Could it be one of the endurance survivors? Then you had better find her before they do, because they're disgusting, and their emotions are of that nature. Ashura then spoke up, realizing what his roommate had indicated. What do you mean? I do. Kill them, Naruto. I'm not going to kill them, Kurama, but I'm going to kick their ass. Patronus walked off the tree and dropped on the couple just as their gazes were drawn up to see his hidden blades emerge from his sleeves. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM, AAAGGGGGHHHH. Heavy panting reverberated as the soaking individual rushed through several bushes and muddy landscapes before coming to a halt beside a waterfall. She ignored the shouts of, help, and curses because her main goal was to get away from the armed guys and to safety. She perked her head slightly as she climbed over an obstacle and arrived on a wooden floor, hiding behind a container. Two men. Both armed and blocking the way, she sat back down, but it was in vain. She is currently in survival mode. She drew her weapon, a handmade bow seized from a corpse, and drew back the string with the arrow in hand, 
releasing the shot and grabbing another just as the first one reached its target. What the? One of the men exclaimed as his partner was silenced by another arrow. Hey, what's going on down there? The archer sought out the call and discovered its source on the rope ladder, climbing down to assist his fallen colleagues. She drew another arrow and fired it at the weak man's back, causing him to fall from his loose grip and scream to his death. Approaching with caution, the young girl searched the bodies for arrows and other valuable items before sheathing her weapon and climbing the rope ladder just as her walkie-talkie crackled. Lara, are you there? Yes, she said, relieved to hear her mentor's voice. I can see smoke coming from the old ruins, are you okay? Oh my god. Roth, I'm in big trouble, they're murdering people. What? Who? Roth exclaimed, surprised. Men, I don't know why. I had no choice but to kill some of them, she acknowledged, her voice shaking. That can't have been easy. It's scary how easy it was, Lara acknowledged as she dragged herself over the ledge's edge. You've got to warn the others, Roth. Don't worry about them for the time being, you just do whatever it takes to get to me, Lara. I'll give it a try. Lara looked around at the old wooden home that was attached to the cliffside. With her mind focused, she noticed something suddenly glowing atop the roof and ascended to it in search of some form of container. Who would leave this behind? She was about to cross a bridge over a local waterfall when she noticed a light near the cascade. Lara had always been intuitive and observant, based on what her parents had told her. Lara learned after they died that she could identify objects or persons of interest with a bright glow of various colors, but she couldn't control it. That is, until she told Roth about it, and since then, he has taught her everything she knows, particularly the talent. Returning to reality, Lara approached the open roof portion and discovered boxes of resources that could be used to enhance her equipment, as well as a logbook. Lara silently knelt against the stone wall that afforded her protection as she heard voices and pocketed it for safety. Just heard from West Beach, one of the armed men told his buddy. Looks like a smaller group escaped into the lower forest. The partner asked a question, perhaps we have a hunting party down there. The first man responded with a shake of his head, no, Father Mathis went himself, told us to stay put. What? Why? The companion inquired, surprised. The first person shook his head, I don't know, maybe another girl for the ritual, we'll know more by tonight. It was like a bloodbath down there. Vladimir is in charge. What did you expect? He stated flatly, he enjoys killing. What does Father Mathis think about that? Not a single damn thing. They don't know he's dead yet, Lara muses as her mind works out a strategy to sneak past them. Crackle, buzz asterisk, what the hell? Both men exclaimed as they went for their radios, is everyone all right? What's going on down there? Help. A black figure asterisk crackle asterisk disappearing asterisk crackle asterisk can't fight asterisk crackle asterisk acting us out. Do you believe in a black figure? No way. Those things are on the other side of the island, and we haven't entered their territory in months. Lara took her bow and arrow, thinking she'd learned enough for now, and aimed at one of the men's necks, but her senses told her otherwise. Once she fires it, one of them might locate her whereabouts. As an alternative, she directed her arrow at the wall near the men and fired it, which clattered noisily. What was that? Asked the man nearest to him, turning around and cautiously approaching the spot. Meanwhile, Lara prepared another arrow and pointed it at the other guy's head before firing it. She drew two more arrows and fired them into the first man's back, causing him to fall forward onto the ground. After clearing the area, Lara approached the bodies and looted them for arrows and other items. Lara refocused her senses and discovered her next target at the top of the sloping hill, which was obscured by the ruins of a wooden house. She located an open window on the second floor and kicked the wall to get to it before falling inside with a small grunt. She's got to be in here somewhere. Find her. Another of the man's orders was hidden by the jumble of boxes and tarps in front of her. Capture or kill? Inquired the lower-ranking officer. Kill her. She's too much trouble. Lara noticed a lamp hanging over the debris and fired another arrow at it, knocking the object atop the crates and setting it ablaze. After hearing the shattered glass, one of her opponents demanded, what was that? Quiet, quiet, yelled the apparent leader, you two double check that side. Lara stooped along the narrow passage, walking until she reached an aperture of the second floor collapsed just as one of the men entered, his flashlight lighting the route. She came to a halt while the man studied the surroundings with his back to her apparently oblivious to her presence. Lara approached the unsuspecting man discreetly, 
grabbing her bow and saying, keep looking. She's gotta be here somewhere. She raised the bow over the man's neck and pressed it against his throat while he attempted to shake her off until his consciousness faded. Lara deftly set the body down to inform his buddy nearby, who was staring at the other section of the small and smoldering chamber. You find anything on that side? A group of soldiers from the upper level inquired. Not a single damned thing. The man in front of Lara was wounded in the back of the head by an arrow and quickly collapsed to the wooden planks. The archer took refuge behind boxes because the room was connected to a cavern with falling water. She spotted two men on the boardwalk on the other side of the cavern with another fleeting flash of her talent. She shot an arrow at both men, attracting the attention of their comrades from higher levels behind her. Apparently, she has a blind spot for her gift. There she is, says the narrator. Fire at her. Hearing that, Lara climbed a nearby box and pushed herself over soon finding cover behind a metal box before retrieving the revolver she had grabbed from one of the men earlier. Lara pointed the barrel at an approaching soldier and fired three shots at him, knocking the armed guy down. Kill her, murder her. One man in particular held a lantern in his hand, which drew both Lara's and the other soldier's attention. What are you doing? You're going to burn down the whole place. I'll burn her out of here, said the obviously insane man as he hurled the light below. As the flames soon spread across the tunnel, the wooden support beams and dry tarps in the room caught fire, causing Lara to run and jump across a gap to another platform that headed outside. She looked around for a way to go to ground level and discovered a rope connecting a nearby wall to the Shinto Torii below. Lara seized her bow and used it to quickly descent the ground as she rolled to minimize the impact. She lit her burned out torch and sprinted into the tunnel behind the Torii until she came to a halt in front of two walls with a thin space between them. The archer crawled between the walls till she reached the top, which was the inside of another cave. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Plateau Village, Mountain Village. Lara heard the familiar sound known to man as she hoisted herself out of the wedge and ran through the hall. Bam 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 bam. Get away, you mutts. Lara spotted her mentor and father figure, Roth firing his dual pistols at the growling wolves until one died when it missed its mark by an inch after hearing the voice and reaching the exit. The rest of the wolves fled after discovering one of their own had died. Roth, I'm coming. Lara said as she rushed towards him after Roth grunted in pain and tiredness and collapsed on his back. When she got to him, they hugged briefly before Roth leaned against a boulder to examine each other's wounds. Roth's left leg bled, and his pant leg was torn and bloodied, Lara had scratches on her shoulders and arms, but the greatest one that attracted Roth's eye was a large hole in her left abdomen. He could tell it had recently been cauterized. Lara expressed her gratitude, saying, thank God you're alive. Roth scoffed, motioning his weapon at the dead wolf. That God has nothing to do with it, he said as he saw Lara begin to wrap a cloth around his injured leg. It's good to see you, too, girl. I'm sorry, they did a real number on your leg, Lara panted as Roth waved her off. No, it looks worse than it is, Roth groaned as his student tightened the fabric over his calf, completing the finishing touches for the time being. Have you heard anything from any of the others? The elder man shook his head as he slowly stood up, which drew Lara's attention. What are you doing? Lara inquired, concerned. Roth fixed his gaze on her. The wolves stole my food pack, which contained the transmitter from the lifeboat. If we don't get that back, we're not getting off this bloody island, he said to Lara. Yeah, but you need, you need bandages, morphine, antiseptic. Lara reasoned back to Roth to persuade him not to go after the wolves. Also included in the pack, Lara cursed with her hands on her hips, shit. Exactly, Roth clarified with his own disappointment before passing out. Lara grabbed him before he hit the ground and carried him near the small fire beneath the open building, where she quickly put him down and checked his pulse. Good, he's still alive, that is excellent. Lara grabbed her revolver and swung the barrel at the one behind her, her eyes widening. She didn't feel the collision, but she did sense the distinct sensation of being in the air as her back touched the ground. Now, now. That wasn't very nice. When the terrified archer looked up, he noticed a guy wearing a black, orange hooded cloak and carrying a sword on his back. She swallowed as images of her death flashed before her eyes, but they vanished as the man extended his hand in front of her. Whether you believe it or not, I'm here to help. Seeing her hesitation, he indicated behind him. If you don't believe my word, trust his. 
When they peeked behind the hooded stranger, they saw one of America's most iconic heroes of all time. His blue and white wing adorned cowl, which matched the colors of his uniform's star spangle banner, and the circular disc-like shield on his left arm clinched the deal. On Yamatai, Captain America was present. Captain America greeted the tired duo with Conrad Roth. Ms. Croft, we're here to assist you, we just received your distress signal. Oh thank God, thank God, Lara exclaimed as she collapsed across Roth. Roth bowed at the famed superhero while supporting his student and foster daughter before his gaze was drawn to the hooded person, notably the crest that served as his belt buckle. Brother? Roth tried not to reveal his surprise when the cloaked figure flipped his wrists and a sword appeared from them. The action grabbed the attention of Captain America and Lara as well. Patronus. Lara's curiosity was piqued when Captain America mentioned the cloaked man's name. What exactly is it? Trouble. When he finished speaking, multiple mist-like apparitions materialized all over the place. Lara and Roth were taken aback when the mists formed monstrous heads with teeth visible through their menacing and perpetual smile. As the flickering flames around their bodies softly illuminated the environment around them, two horns protruded from the tops of her misshapen foreheads. But there was one question on their thoughts. Why are there different colors of them? One question was distinct from the others, yet it was still a question. Stay here with Mr. Roth, Ms. Croft, while Patronus and I. Roth cut him off with a pointed finger, he's already gone. When the living legend looked up again, he noticed Patronus mowing down several of the floating heads with his little blades. He could hear the young hero chuckling as he double-stabbed two of their opponents with fast precision and thrusts. Patronus turned around and waved to his audience after dispatching the last one nearby. What are you waiting for? An invite. What? Your blades are on fire, Lara exclaimed as the stated hero examined his flame-bearing blades. Patronus shouted in astonishment and rolled around on the ground, trying to put out the fires, and a sweat drop fell down her temple. Is he really a hero? She wondered, looking at the sheepishly masked Rogers. Yep, though I'm having second thoughts right now, Captain America acknowledged candidly as Patronus paused his current action. I heard that. Patronus scowled at the seasoned hero until he heard Karama ask him to check his hidden blades. He did so and discovered that the flames did not burn his arms or hands, he actually felt fine. Several theories came to mind, but only one was correct. The adamantine metal used in the creation of the plates and hidden blades. Since adamantine is claimed to be the metal of the gods, it most certainly has characteristics that can either absorb an enemy's power or defend its wielder. Behind you, says the narrator. Patronus barely looked up to see the shield coming at him, ducking beneath another as the defensive weapon took out a blazing head, ricocheted off a house's wall to hit another, and another, and another. He, Lara, and Roth watched as the shield bounced about the area, defeating all but one of the flaming heads. Be careful. When Lara heard Patronus' voice, she turned back, retrieved her bow, and fired her arrow as the last head bobbled in the air before falling and disappearing, while the shield returned to Captain America's possession, although in flames. What's the deal with your shield, Captain? Roth inquired before turning to face the approaching Patronus, and your razor blades, kid. The cloaked hero responded with an innocent and breezy whistle tune, while the soldier giggled uneasily. Custom made, both heroes said, much to the chagrin of the civilians. Lara took a step forward and began to work, traveling in the direction of where the wolves had fled, until she was stopped in her tracks by Captain America. Ms. Croft, you need to stay here, Rogers urged the young girl, but she refused. Roth needs the medicine in the food pack, and that was taken from the wolves, I'm going after them. Lara tried to push the hero aside, but his superhuman status prevented her from doing so, so she walked around him. He took another step in front of her, obstructing her path. Let me go. Ms. Croft. Let her. Three pairs of eyes focused on Patronus, who had crossed his arms. I've seen her handle herself, he said as he stepped away from the ledge and approached Lara and the captain. I'll go with her because, as the saying goes, there's power in numbers. Lara cocked her brow. However, in this case, we're drifting apart. A, tomato, tomato, Patronus said as he started strolling towards the jungle. Besides, you're probably the only one of us who has medical training, C.A., he remarked aloud. Lara exchanged a troubled look with Roth, who nodded stiffly but signed with his fingers. Be cautious and vigilant. Captain America noticed the sign but chose to shout out to Patronus instead of addressing it. 
the hooded ninja whirled around and caught something thrown at him by the living legend. Naruto recognizes it as a technological device made to fit onto the wearer's forearm after seeing one attached to Captain America's right arm. Naruto did the same, attaching the device beneath the hidden blade's bracer beneath the blade itself. See you later, Captain. Are you coming, Lara or what? He cried out as Lara quickly followed him. May the creed guide you both, Roth said quietly to his brother and pupil. And his hope for their safety would be severely tested as the hurdles ahead of them would put both their physical and mental capacities to the test. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Patronus cast a peek at his hesitant companion, who fought to keep up with him as they climbed past many run-down houses. Despite the scars around her arms, she was stunningly lovely. Her silky dark brown thick hair was done up in a ponytail, with the front layered and jagged, while her deep brown eyes studied everything around her. Her slim and toned figure was the consequence of apparent and intense training, as seen by her attire. She wore a blue tank top over a white tank, tan cargo pants, and dark boots. A quiver of arrows and a bow were slung over her back, while a revolver was holstered on her left side. Will you focus? Patronus stepped forward after being summoned and narrowly avoided collapsing against a wooden wall. Hearing a disapproving moan, the ninja looked at Lara as she efficiently lifted herself higher, impressing the blonde in the process. Patronus had hoisted himself to the mountaintop and seen Lara standing in front of a cave. The wolves went in there, she was certain. How can you tell? Patronus inquired, noting that there were no tracks owing to the rain. Initiative, she said as she lit her torch with a neighboring lantern and entered the dark cavern. Patronus followed her inside, using his kitsune sense to look ahead in case the wolves approached. They crossed a few skeletal mounds before reaching a vast area, where a wolf raced by them, startling them even more as Lara drew her pistol. They walk across the space over littered skeletons of both animal and human skeletons because the wolf did not return. I just want the pack, that's all, Lara muttered to herself rather than the wolves. They came upon a small cavern with a larger mound of skeletons heaped on top of each other, and Lara detected a bulge on the far side. She pushed the remains aside till the packet appeared beneath the flames. Got it. Lara remarked relievedly as she pocketed it and turned around, moving around Patronus in the process. All right, I need to get this back to Roth. We will, unless something prevents us from doing so in the first place. Lara rolled her eyes as she retraced their steps, but not before the wolf from earlier leapt at her with snarled fangs. Patronus, on the other hand, had seen it coming with Kitsune's sense and pushed the girl out of the way, taking her place. He did not, however, intend to become its dinner. Patronus moved his body diagonally, allowing the wolf to pass past as he threw his left arm at the creature's neck with his hidden blade extended. Patronus pinned the wolf's head to the ground with his free arm until it lost all motor functions. Arigato, Naruto said as he drew his hidden blade and wiped the blood from it. Lara grabbed the torch and proceeded to the exist while watching the cloaked figure's blade withdraw within his sleeve, but not before saying, thank you. No problem. Patronus said as he followed her back to the tent in a sequence of acrobatics and free running. They returned to find Captain America tending to an unconscious Roth, who, upon seeing them, implored Lara to treat him. She did so with a deftness that could only come from years of expertise. Then they waited for Roth to regain consciousness, which meant Lara could rest for the time being. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Roth jumped straight up with a loud gasp, as he gazed around, alerting the trio to his awakening. Lara assisted him in scooting across the floor to a better position against a rock before sitting down next to him as Roth examined the work on his leg. Not bad. Where does a young lady like you learn something like that? Roth mocked Lara as she laughed. Lara said, late shift at the nine bells. A wolf's got nothing on a broken bottle. Patronus had to inquire as to when he put it together. You learned how to do this at a bar. Yes, she replied tensely, astounded the ninja, is something wrong with that? I was going to say impressive, but with your attitude lately, I'm not saying anything. Captain America moved into the space between the two kids. All right, let's take it easy, the youngsters mocked as they turned away from each other. What's the plan, Mr. Roth? He said of the old gentleman. The plan is to take that. He motioned at Lara's feet with the device, and connected it to the radio station atop the mountain behind us which will send a strong signal in all directions. That sounds good. Patronus placed a hand on Cap's shoulder and said, hold on a minute. What about your shield gadgets? Can't we ask for help with these things? 
he asked, pointing to the device on his right arm. For some reason, I can't get a strong enough signal to any station within a 10-mile radius of the island, Captain America said candidly, surprising the trio. I didn't expect this at all. Hopefully, with the radio station and Roth's device here, the signal will be amplified enough to reach the authorities for assistance. Hopefully. Very reassuring coming from you, Patronus said flatly, ending with a sigh. But who's going to go? Lara inquired, despite knowing the answer. Roth noticed the uncertain expression on her face. Lara, we need to send that SOS, and I'm not going to be climbing anytime soon. I was afraid you were going to say something like that. Roth shifted his weight to get a closer look at her. You can do it, Lara. After all, you're a croft. I don't think I'm that kind of croft, Lara acknowledged, a little bitterly and doubtfully. Are they a big deal or something, C.A.? Patronus asked the soldier beside him. The crofts are the device I gave you, but basically they are aristocrats, Rogers replied as Roth handed Lara his climbing axe for her next test. Roth responded confidently, you just don't know it yet. Lara smirked as she gazed at Roth, inspired but terrified. Well, let's hope I'm a quick learner then, she said as Roth grabbed her hand. Just be careful, Lara, the elderly guy said as she stood up and walked towards the mountain's base. He nodded and exchanged eyes with the hooded hero, instructing him to keep her safe. Patronus returned the nod and followed Lara as both ancient men stared at one other. So, what are we going to do? Roth inquired of the living legend. Let's get you well first, then wait for those two to return, and then we'll head back to our base, which Patronus and I have set up near the beach. Roth sat down against the rock and tried to get as much rest as he could. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM The radio on her belt blared with Roth's voice as he approached her in front of a craggy wall on the edge of a platform, and both Patronus and Lara heard him. Lara, you might want to try your axe on that rock wall over there first. Lara nodded and brought out the axe, which she used to climb the wall with ease despite the rain. When she got to the top, she peered down to see Patronus waiting there. What's the matter? Are you afraid of heights? Ha ha ha, he answered sarcastically, extending his hidden blades and climbing the wall using his chakra to aid stabilize his footing. After reaching the top, he sneered at her, which Lara detected and looked away from. The pair ran through an old rusted plain that served as a bridge and ascended numerous ridges until reaching another Japanese wooden bridge in front of a waterfall. Their voyage was halted, however, when Lara discovered white chalk paintings on a neighboring wall. Uh, Lara. Where are you going? Patronus said as his female companion dropped down to the mass of water and observed her enter a cave with more white chalk drawings. Hello. You can stay if you want, but I'm going in. Fine, then. Patronus crossed his arms as Lara entered the cave, and it took some time for her to return with a bag draped over her left shoulder. What exactly was in there? A tomb, Lara said curtly as she marched ahead, leaving Patronus after her until he stood right next to her. A tomb? Are you sure it's a good idea to disturb someone's resting place? There was no body, so it's fine. Patronus followed Lara to the other side of the bridge, which took them back to the wolf's cave, where the archer quickly scaled the rugged wall at the entrance. To avoid looking at the vista above him, the hooded hero noticed a stable wall atop the cave's entrance and sprang to the top, holding securely before climbing to the top with ease. Thank you, assassins free running. Patronus said as he reached the top and walked to the edge where Lara had just reached the top. Her eyes widened in surprise as she gazed up, before they returned to below and at him. What? How did you? I'm a climber, Patronus replied, offering a hand, which Lara ignored and pushed past. You're very welcome. The pair ascended to the next higher level, when they heard voices and took cover behind boxes. Hey, you find anything? One of the strangers exclaimed above the din of the wind. His friend, who was hiding under a shelter on the other side, responded. Nothing. There's no one up here, they never make it this far. Should we head back up to the bunker? Nah, let's just wait it out in the storm. Got it. Stay alert. Let's move inside. Patronus used a short flash of his kitsune sense to locate three guys nearby, one on the right side and two on the left. He looked at Lara, who was holding her bow, and pointed to her right, then to himself and the soldiers on the left. I have them you have the last one. Patronus reached into his pouch and drew out two shuriken as Lara nodded and prepared an arrow. Naruto counted from three, dot two, dot one, with his free hand. Gah! Arg! OFPMH! 
Patronus' two shurikens struck their enemies' backs, but Lara's arrow entered through his neck. After ensuring that the coast was clear, the two resumed their ascent to the top of the falls, where the last wooden bridge they encountered began to break due to age. Go, go, go! Patronus exclaimed as they dashed to the opposite side. However, the bridge had cracked in the middle, forcing them to jump for it while Lara barely managed to get her axe out in time and Naruto used his strength to dig his fingers quietly into the wall. When Lara's radio blared with someone's voice, the duo climbed to the top. Lara. Dot are you there? Reyes. Did you find Sam? Lara said as they traveled down the hill, through stone walls. We're still on her trail. We're going to try to send an SOS from an old radio tower up here, Lara said. Wait, we? Who are, we? On the island, we're not alone. Captain America and his sidekick are here to assist us. Patronus resented being referred to as a sidekick, but chose to be the better person and remain silent as Reyes expressed her joy that assistance had arrived for them. Can you hear me, Cap? Equals, is there something wrong, Patronus? Equals, not for the time being. Lara just received word from one of her friends through her radio, Patronus said after rolling up his right sleeve and activating the blue, white screen. I'm thinking that we should be on the same frequency to stay in touch, can touch screens do that? When it comes to technology, shield is second to none, do you have the frequency? Can't you ask Roth, who has the same radio as Lara? Good point. Lara, tell your friend to wait for a response from Roth, Patronus said as they came to a halt in the middle of the route. Captain America had isolated the two frequencies into a private channel after obtaining them and instructed Patronus to speak. Reyes, was it? This is Patronus, and I'm with Lara at the top of the mountain. You're a guy? Yeah, Patronus said hesitantly. Don't try any funny business with Lara or I'll gut you like a pig. As Captain America spoke through the connection, a sweat drop landed on Naruto's hooded head, and Lara laughed at his predicament. Equals, I can assure you, Ms. Reyes, that Patronus is not that type of person, and he will keep an eye out for her. I trust your word, Captain America, hopefully, we'll make it out alive. Patronus taunted through the touchscreen, have faith, why don't you? Lara spoke next through her radio, rolling her eyes, do you have any advice for the SOS? This is Alex, Patronus, and Captain America, and you need to find the communications console, which will look like a bunch of old switchboards. What's a switchboard? Patronus inquired, mirroring Lara's deadpan demeanor, what? All right, I'll let you know when I find it, Lara remarked as she and her hesitant companion came to a halt in front of a cliff. A post was placed to the side and a rope was fastened to it, with the other end attached below. Lara used her bow to glide down without regard for anything below, while Patronus hopped off and sprawled on the ground to lessen the impact. Both activities, however, drew the notice of unseen bystanders. Hey! Hey! Wake up, we've got intruders, how'd they get up here? Fear gripped Lara as she leveled her rifle at the armed men. Please, you don't need to do this, she ducked beneath a burning bottle and was forced to fire guns at them. Patronus dashed by Lara, charging at one of the soldiers near the cave and knocking him out with an elbow strike. One gunshot pierced one man's head, as the remaining of them dashed at her with a machete, ready to strike. When Patronus saw this, he drew a shuriken and hurled it at the man wielding the machete, while Lara fired the bullet through his head. Lara searched the bodies for ammo, both arrows and bullets, before entering the cave with her significantly taller friend after lighting her torch. How many caves exist? Patronus inquired, exasperatedly. More than you can count, apparently. Patronus let that go as they forced themselves in a small space and made it to the other side, which opened to a plain region with wreckage and a pair of burning empty oil drummers. Lara extinguished her torch and expressed her concern, I just have a bad feeling about this. You, too, huh? Patronus agreed after he and Lara sat beside a roaring fire and observed something far out in the distance. He assumed it was the radio tower they were looking for because it was a massive blinking structure, it seems that the distance would be difficult for them. He then heard many voices appear out of nowhere and noticed Lara holding a video camera, watching its contents to relieve some of her stress from the events of the day. Are those your close friends? Patronus inquired of Lara, who did not respond. Okay, I have to ask, is there a problem between you and me? Look, I'm not sure what your problem is with me, but we're in this together now. If you like it or not. Patronus acknowledged his worry as he moved up to give her some room. Question. Why haven't you used your ninjutsu? Those guys in this whole situation aren't exactly the type of thing that calls for it. 
I also don't want Captain America to find out about them. Naruto responded via the link. Hopefully, I don't have to use them on this island. Then it was Ashura's turn to speak up. Although I have a feeling you won't be so lucky again anytime soon. His partners let out two groans. What? You have just jinxed us, you have just jinxed us. Kurama and Naruto both screamed via the link, prompting Ashura to hide his ears. Lara took a few glances at the angry hooded heroes back in her camera before her gaze returned to the camera's screen. The footage was taken many hours before the ship's disaster and the wild storm that brought it down. The final few seconds of the film showed her with wrath, with the latter commenting on Lara's immense potential and how happy her father would be of her. She knew the road ahead of her would be difficult, what with the insane armed guys and her missing pals, but she wasn't alone today. Lara stated that she was still terrified, but she had gained the confidence to proceed. Her pals required her assistance. Roth required her success in order to get that SOS out. Although she would never confess it to Patronus, Lara was relieved to have someone like him keeping an eye on her. All she could hope was that nothing worse awaited them. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Yamatai North Sector, ah. After the anguished scream had been quickly muffled, a murmur of pleasure resonated across the dark tunnels. One of her paralyzed victims lay on the ground, horrified, and silently peed his pants as he watched the thing suck his friend's life. He tried to quiet his heart in order to avoid the thing stealing him away like his company had. But that was just wishful thinking. No, no 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 no. Oh, please calm down, my darling. Despite her gripping his face tightly, the man remained immobile as his nerves became abruptly quiet. His body was slowly being enveloped with silk-like webbing ejected from her wings because he was so quiet and strangely at rest. As the beast dug her fangs into his jugular, draining his blood, his eyes widened in horror. The gulps of blood were audible before the apparent female beast eventually let go of her now paled and lifeless victim, lusciously licking her lips as her thirst was satisfied. Dot for now. That didn't stop her from considering scouring the island for new victims. The monster took flight through the little hole leading out of her shelter, soaring into the skies in quest of her next meal. The end of the chapter. That's it for this podcast. Thank you for listening to this video. I hope you did enjoy this video story. And if you did, like, share, and subscribe for more. And thank you all for having support and have a great day.